Hello and welcome to another episode of Winemaking 101, the series where I answer the fundamental questions about winemaking at home. We have a brilliant question today and it's one of those that catches a lot of people out. And the question is, how do I know when my wine is ready to be bottled? And there are five simple tests you can do to make sure your wine is ready to be bottled. If you fulfill all of these five tests, you know your wine is going to be awesome when you come to pour it out of the end of the bottle. These five tests are fermentation, flocculation, CO2 levels, clarity and taste. We will now go through all of these step by step, test by test, and I'll explain what they all mean. Then hopefully when you bottle your wine, it's going to come out into the glass being amazing. Because that is what I want. I want us all to make better wine. So let's jump that side of the camera to the workbench and we'll go through these things together. And we're here at the workbench. I have chosen two wines that I think are ready to be bottled up. So the five tests, what are they? The first is fermentation. Has fermentation finished? Simple to check. I've talked you through this in a previous video about how to use a hydrometer. So I'm going to be extracting a sample and testing it to make sure there's no sugar left in the wine. And that is looking spot on for the temperature of the wine. I'm quite happy that there is no sugar left in the wine. Plenty of sweetness, but no actual sugar to be turned into alcohol. The next step is flocculation. To be honest, it sounds like something you would ask for in a S&M club, flocculation. Oh, I can have half an hour of flocculation with you, please. Absolutely. How do you like your flocculation? Anyway, in all seriousness, what flocculation really means is how quickly does the yeast flocculate and has it finished flocculating? How many times can I say flocculate in a sentence and keep a straight face? Not that many, to be honest. As yeast strains come to their maturity, they will flock together and clump up into bigger, bigger cell structures. Then the weight of these make them drop down to the bottom of your demijohn or carboy. Flocculation, they flock together and drop. Different yeast strains have different flocculation rates. And it's normally a measure in terms of percentage. And the higher the percentage, the faster your yeast cells will flocculate. So have a look in the packet, it may or may not tell you. You may need to do a bit of digging online to find out the flocculation rates. The main time you want to know the flocculation percentage is when you're making a sparkling wine or a champagne style wine. Champagne yeast has a very high flocculation percentage. And this comes down to why and when you would add a champagne yeast to a sparkling wine. I will do a sparkling wine video at some point soon. What does this mean to you and your wine? And how does it influence when you should bottle? Well, quite simply put, you want to make sure that all of the yeast has flocculated together and fallen to the bottom of your demijohn. You can tell this by looking at the bottom of your demijohn and there's been no sediment drop, yeast cell structure drop to the bottom of the demijohn in 30 days. You can be quite assured that there is no yeast left. It has all flocculated out. So come and check my Daisy wine and we'll see if all the yeast has flocculated out. There is a small, tiny, tiny, tiny quantity of dead yeast cells in the bottom. It's very marginal. That could have come out with the last rack. I am not too worried about this wine by here. I'm pretty sure the flocculation is over. Done. Yeast gone. So now we can say that there's no sugar left in the wine and no yeast left in the wine. This means that nothing further can ferment in the wine. It's void of sugar, 
it's void of yeast and they are the two main elements of fermentation. You wait until they've been removed, fantastic. It's not going to have another party in your bottle and cause your bottle to explode because you have eliminated all the fermentables, the yeast and the sugar. Happy days, your wine is now safe to be bottled. But just because your wine is safe to be bottled, is it ideal to be bottled? And here we go into point number three, which goes hand in hand with flocculation. I do wonder how many times I'm going to say flocculation. I might put a counter up by here and count because flocculation. Anyway, clarity of your wine. You want your wine to be as clear as you can get it. Time will clear your wine for you, as would eggshells and as would chemical fining agents. I personally prefer not to use fining agents and let time do its job. This daisy wine by here has cleared really well on its own accord. I have not done anything to it to help it clear. How would you tell if your wine is really, really clear? There's two different tests. One is for a white wine and one is for a red wine. For a white wine, you want to be able to put a book behind the demijohn and be able to read the words clearly and easily. So come on, let's go and do that now and check the clarity of the wine. Yes, very easy to read that dried elderberry wine recipe through my daisy wine, clear as day. Bright, easy to read, no issues there at all. For a red wine, slightly different. You aren't expected to read a recipe or a book through the wine because of the natural color difference. The black letters will get absorbed by the red and you couldn't really see it, no matter how clear it's going to be. So the way we do it for red wines, is grab a torch and shine a light through it. And if the torch beam comes out the other side with full energy and brightness in either, it's easy to shine a torch beam through your red wine. You know it's clear. Both the daisy wine and the blackberry mead are clear as day. I'm satisfied with their clarity. No fluctuation has occurred in either and also they are bright and sparkly and clear. The beam of the light passes through. You can read a book through the daisy wine. Satisfied. Happy days. Moving on to the next test now, which is dissolved CO2 in the wine. A lot of people believe you should degas a wine, which means getting a big electric drill in there and shake it all up very, very vigorously to remove all the CO2. I disagree, you shouldn't. The concept of degassing your wine that way manually came about when wine kits promised a wine in seven days or 10 days. They want that CO2 out of the wine quickly. So they say to stir vigorously, either using a specialized drill bit or with a great big spoon and whip it up for five, 10 minutes each. Yes, it get, gets rid of the CO2, but it lets in a lot of oxygen and oxygen is no good for wines really. Time will do it for you. If you have the inclination and the patience to make a wine the way it should be made, wine should not be rushed. Anyway, how do you check for CO2? You can buy all sorts of CO2 meters that you would put into the wine and it'll give you a percent reading. The lower the reading, the less CO2. The higher the reading, the more CO2. But you do not need one of those gizmos. You have eyes and you have taste buds. After you've put your wine into a trial jar, you want to let it stand for about five minutes and then see how many bubbles are rising to the surface. If you can't count any bubbles rising to the surface, that's a very good indication that CO2 is not dispersed in the wine. The second method of testing is your taste buds. Have a sip. Does it feel carbonated on the tongue? Does it taste like lemonade that's been left out for a few hours and there's just those little tiny bubbles but it's not quite fizzy, so have a wee sample. You'll be able to tell. There is nothing worse than having slightly fizzy wine. It's not fizzy enough to be sparkling wine. 
Yet, it's not flat enough that you can hold in your mouth for a while and enjoy the flavours. Because there's this little fizzy, 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 fizzy on the back of your tongue. That's what you want to try and avoid. I had none of that in my daisy wine. I can't see any bubbles, I can't taste any bubbles. I'm quite satisfied that it's been degassed naturally. I don't need to get a drill bit in there and give it a great bit stir with a drill. No, I'm not going to uh, treat my wines that way. And the final test, test number five, is the flavour of the wine. This is the point where you want to decide if the wine is ready to go into the bottle, or now is the time you need to decide if you need to back sweeten your wine, add more body to your wine, or blend your wine with a different wine that gives you the desired result you want from your wine. Ideally, always aim to make the wine the way you want it to end up. That way you won't need to back sweeten and you won't need to blend the wine. If you design the recipe to how you want it to be, the end result will be how you want it to be, then you don't need to faff with blending or back sweetening. And having a wee sample at this point is the best time to tell before it goes in the bottle. It's matured, you know the end result. So, grab your trial jar. It's called a trial jar for a reason, so put it to the test, put it to the trial. Have a good wee sample. Now that is shockingly good for a daisy wine. Sweet yet dry. Needs more time to mature. High-end floral notes jumping down Wow, it definitely has that daisy, floral, springtime, early summer, grass-cutting aroma in the back of the nose. Really good. Yeah. Wait there a second. As with a lot of floral wines, it does lack a little bit of body to it. That little bit of venosity is missing. It could do with another little burst of body. I didn't add raisins to the wine. I didn't add banana. It does have the tannin from the tea bag I added, which definitely benefits the floral notes. But it does lack that bit of body. It goes down the throat far too quickly. It doesn't slosh around your mouth. But how can you rectify the body of a wine once you've made it? I will show you in the next video. Have fun now.